Go. Welcome to the National Youth Festival 2022, and I'm your host for this session, Bharat Jain. Now, before we begin today's session, I'm proud to present to you two AVs. One on our unsung heroes, and the second on Mere Sapno Ka Bharat, a collection of essays from the youth of India. So, can we have the AVs, please? Swami Vivekananda once said, friends, that if we wish to progress in life, it is important for us to look at our roots, our history, and the very seed that bloomed our civilization. So on the account of the 25th edition of the National Youth Festival, which aims to ignite and fuel young minds, we want our young nation to connect with our roots and foremost, know our history right. So we are joined by a stalwart who firmly believes in the Yuva Shakti and who has helped the government of India steer the reforms and initiatives to propel the economy forward as the principal economic advisor. An economist, an author, a renowned historian, we have with us Sanjeev Sanyalji sharing his thoughts on the lesser known history of the river Saraswati River and its significance to our civilizational existence. Ladies and gentlemen, please Help me in welcoming with a huge round of applause. Zor Dada Ali Kisar Swagat Kije, Shri Sanjeev Sanyal Jiga. Namaskar, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here to speak to you at the National Youth Festival. Um, so what I'm going to do today is to tell you a little bit about the Saraswati River. As some of you may already be aware, the Saraswati River plays a very important role uh, in our civilizational history. All our ancient texts uh, speak frequently about this river. In fact, it is deified as the river, that, uh, as the, knowledge, uh, as the uh, uh, goddess of knowledge. And uh, so it's a very important part 
of how we think about the origins of Indian civilization. The problem is, of course, that there is no river today uh, called the Saraswati, that is, uh, you know, large river uh, that is flowing. So the question uh, that always arises is, was there such a river? If there was such a river, uh, where was it? And of course, there are some who will have argued in the past that uh, this river is entirely mythical. But what I'm going to try and show you today is that far from uh, being a mythical river, so the Saraswati River was in fact a real living river, um, that it flowed um, uh, 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 over long uh, thousands of years, but of course, uh, with varying fortunes. So it, uh, it, it went through periods of drying up, then it came back, then it dried up again. And many of these things are remembered in our ancient texts. So what I'm going to try and do is take you through some of the, the, the text where, where we know about uh, the Saraswati, what is the archeology, span where are these sites? And of course, very importantly, what's the geology and the scientific evidence about the existence of this river. So what I'm going to do now is to share with you a PowerPoint presentation. If you will uh, spare me a moment, here we are. Uh, oops, uh, just a minute. Is that, uh, is that being shared? Can everyone see this? Just a minute. Share screen. And this is the screen. Share. And here we go. So, as I mentioned that we were going to talk about the Saraswati, the river that gave birth to our civilization. And the question is, how and, and what are the texts uh, say about this river? So, right in the beginning, let me say that it is by far the most important river mentioned in our earliest texts, particularly in the Rig Veda. Many of you will know that the Rig Veda is the oldest uh, Hindu uh, scripture. Uh, it was composed and uh, initially uh, purely as an oral text um, somewhere between uh, uh, 5,000 and 6,000 years ago. And I'm going to some, uh, uh, talk to you a little about the proof of this dating a little later. But for the purposes here, let me point out that that for, no less than 45 of the hymns of the Rig Veda Shah prays on the Saraswati and her name appears 72 times. So there is no question of her importance. Moreover, there are three full hymns in the Rig Veda that are totally dedicated to the Saraswati. And she often appears in the company of two uh, possibly other deities. They're called Ila and Bharti. Um, some would argue that the name Bharti at least is just another name for the Saraswati. Just remember that because I will come back to it a little later. And how is it described? It's described as a great flood. It's, the, it's described as the great among the great, the most impetuous of rivers, limitless, unbound, swift flowing, surpassing in majesty, and so on. Uh, it's the mother of waters or Sindhu Mata. So clearly, this is not any trivial river. It's clearly a large river. And remember, these are a people who are also um, exposed to other rivers like the Indus and the Ganga. So these are the, the people who are talking about this uh, are, are uh, you know, aware of the Ganga and the Indus and such large rivers. So even then, they are talking about this river in uh, this way. So clearly, this was not a minor river. Now, the issue here is, of course, that, as I mentioned, there is no such river of that size, uh, especially at the locations that one would expect them. So, not surprisingly, there are historians who have tried to either say that it is mythical uh, or um, uh, there are others who try to uh, place it somewhere in Afghanistan or Central Asia and so on and so forth. Now, you know, you can do all kinds of contortions to try and place it in another part of the world. But the fact is that the Rig Veda very clearly mentions where the Saraswati flowed. So, let us look at what the Rig Veda have to say. So in the Nadistuti Suktam uh, of the Rig Veda, and I've given all the references, by the way, everything in this uh, lecture is properly referenced. So you don't have to believe what I'm saying. You can go and quickly uh, look them up yourself. And in the Nadistuti Suktam, uh, it goes, 
ओ गंगा यमुना सरस्वती शुतुद्रु विच इज द सटलेज परुस्नी दिस इज द रावी अस्किनी विच इज द चेनाब एंड सो ऑन एंड सो फॉर नाउ यू कैन सी व्हाट इज गोइंग ऑन हियर द रिवर्स आर बीइंग इनोमरेटेड क्लियरली ईस्ट टू वेस्ट देयर इज नो डाउट अबाउट दिस नाउ हियर यू कैन सी एग्जैक्टली वेयर द सरस्वती रिवर इज प्लेस्ड इट इज समवेयर बिटवीन द यमुना एंड द सटलेज देयर इज एब्सोल्युटली नो uh question of doubt in this matter so we know that this is a river that was used to flow between the shutudru or the satlej and the yamuna so that is clear now what else do we know about it we also know that it came out of bursting out of the ridges of the hills so we have it says in the rigveda again she with her might like one who digs for lotus stems had burst with a strong wave the ridges of the hills so it's something that comes out of the hills and we know also the in the rigveda mentions mountains the ocean load of streams saraswati yes so it says pure is a course from the mountains to the ocean alone of the stream saraswati hath listen so again you can clearly see that it is a river that goes from the mountains it bursts out of the hills and it flows all the way to the ocean now the question is where could this be is there any evidence of such a river and it turns out that a lot of the satellite imagery shows you that there was indeed such a river in exactly the place that you would expect it so these are this is sort of a this is what the satellite imagery would show you can see the blue lines which are of existing rivers and other rivers but you see the green line well there is a paleo channel of a river that you can see it on on the top right hand side you can see it comes out of the himalayas there are lots of channels coming out and it makes its way through rajasthan through haryana then rajasthan out into what is now pakistan and then comes out and flows into the run of kutch or what is now the run of kutch but at that time and as i will show you a little later that was actually the estuary of two major rivers one was the indus which used to go into the into the sea a little east of where it does today and of the uh, of the saraswati uh, or this of this channel this channel is today called the ghaggar and uh, in haryana and the hakras further down so the ghaggar river is essentially this this channel and even today if it rains very heavily the upper reaches of it flow for a few months Uh, during the monsoons or into the early winter so <clears throat> this river is uh, this river channel is still there and there is still a fair amount of uh, moisture in the ground through those paleo channels also notice that this is not one paleo channel but it keeps shifting around so it's a river that through the course of its history did move around quite a bit which is makes sense because um, you know you're dealing with very flat uh, terrain and at different points in time it obviously changed so here was a river came out of the himalayas flowed through haryana Raj, northern rajasthan into what is pakistan out into the run of kutch the run of kutch would have been like an estuary of these indus and the and the saraswati and uh, it would have been quite different from what it looks like today now if you had such a river clearly it would must have been of some importance to uh, civilizations of that time and is there archaeological evidence uh, of uh, these of uh, this uh, river uh, or its importance in archaeology well it turns out uh, uh, that if you map and plot the archae major archaeological sites of the mature harappan period they come out and you can see there is a huge number of bunching along this dry paleo channel of the ghaggar uh, and i will show you later this is also true of the early harappan as well and even in the late harappan although the major sites disappear uh, the upper reaches of this river system are clearly still quite heavily populated so clearly this is a river of some deep importance to the uh, um, the um, harappan civilization it's very often called the indus valley civilization but as you can see these sites are not clustered along the indus 
or its tributaries for that matter, but along this dry riverbed. So clearly there's something important about this and it's not just true in Haryana and Rajasthan or, and, and uh, 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 into the Cholistan desert of Pakistan, but you can even see they're all clustered around even Gujarat where the um, estuary of this river was. Now, let me give you a sense of this estuary. A very important thing that you have to understand is that sea levels during the Bronze Age were higher than what they are today, right? They were higher than what they are today. And therefore, the Saurashtra Peninsula, what is now a peninsula, was actually an island and so was Kutch. And what you now know as the run of uh, Kutch and the Little Run were actually uh, uh, part of the it was part of the sea. It was the estuary. It was water, uh, and uh, the Saraswati and the Indus flowed into this. And so, if you had uh, visited this part of the world uh, during the Bronze Age, it would perhaps have looked a lot more like the Sundarbans look like today. It was much better. The climate was much much better, and uh, it was um, uh, these islands and one of the major sites of the. Uh, uh, Harappan period, <clears throat> which is Dholavira, you can see that it's an island. Uh, but incidentally, it's a beautiful site. Please do go and visit it. And when you visit it, you will immediately realize that it is this. Uh, it was an island which is now marooned in the middle of salt flats, but it was a real island and it was a port. This is important because Dholavira was a very major port. And from Dho if you wanted to get to Dholavira, there are two major routes to get to Dholavira if you were doing transoceanic um, uh, voyages. So if you wanted to go outwards, you would probably sail down through the Gulf of Kutch, out past Dwarka and towards the uh, Persian Gulf, where we know the Harappans used to trade with the Omanis, the, uh, 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 the Mesopotamians, particularly the Sumerians and so on. And so there's a lot of evidence of uh, uh, trade of the Harappans with the Middle East. And this is the route they would have taken out past Dwarka, out to there. And there is an island there in Dwarka called Beit Dwarka and a lot of um, uh, uh, Harappan era anchors have been found. But if you wanted to go south, you would probably go through what is the little run of Kutch and go past Lothal. You can again see that Lothal was not far inland as it is today, but was in fact connected to this channel and you would go out through that, through the Gulf of Kambat and out. Now in both cases, it's quite interesting. Those of you who have been to Lothal will see one thing very interesting, that when you go to Lothal, there is a very large dry docks and a very small settlement. Why was it like that? Why, I mean, if there wasn't a large urban settlement at Lothal, why did it have these dry docks? Well, very simple reason. Most likely, both Dwarka and Lothal were actually customs checkpoints. So if, if merchants were coming from outside, they would stop at Lothal or Dwarka, get their goods checked, and then they would sail to Dholavira, which was the main port. They would exchange goods and so on. And then perhaps when the Indus was flowing and the Saraswati were also flowing, they would perhaps sail up north uh, along the, these river, uh, rivers. Now, the question then arises is, why is this river, the Saraswati, so important? After all, this is a terrain with lots of other rivers. Uh, and certainly... Um, once it began drying, it couldn't have been the bigger, biggest of rivers. Why is this river so, so important? And the reason is that it was the uh, main river, the Saraswati was the main river uh, that flowed through the homeland of a tribe called the Bharatas. So the Bharatas were a tribe who lived in what is roughly now Haryana. And the name, of course, is obviously important, and I'll come back to that. But the Bharata tribe lived along the bank, upper reaches of the, of the Saraswati between the Saraswati on one side and another river called the Drishadvati on the other, which is now another dry river, uh, river bed called the Chautam. So between these two rivers was a tribe that was living called the Bharatas, and they used to call their homeland the land of the seven rivers or Sapta Sindhu. This is the earliest geographical term that has been used in the uh, Rig Veda or in any Indic text. So Sapta Sindhu. Now, 
very often when this term is used, um, <clears throat> people assume that, you know, must be, maybe even if you include the Saraswati, it must include Saraswati, the five rivers of Punjab and the Indus. That's how they come to Saptisind. That is actually not correct. The Rig Veda is very, very clear that the Saraswati and its six other uh, uh, tributaries is what makes up the Sapta Sindhu. It's a, so it's only about the Saraswati and its tributaries. And it clearly it comes to uh, mention, as you can see, I will talk in the Rig Veda mentions a hymn where it says, come together glorious, loudly roaring Saraswati, mother of floods, the seventh, with the copious milk, with the fair streams fairly flowing, fully swelled by the volume of their waters. You can clearly see that all these other rivers were flowing into the Saraswati. So this is consequently a very limited area. And I would argue only what is Haryana, maybe a little bit of the adjoining parts of Punjab and adjoining parts of Rajasthan, but that is about it. So it's a very limited area. It does not include most of Punjab. And I will show you it is also uh, corroborated by the Mahabharata. Because in the Mahabharata, when Balram goes on a pilgrimage, he goes to a pilgrimage to the Sapta <coughs> Saraswat or the seven Saraswats. And when he does this, he goes and visits the seven Saraswatis as part of his pilgrimage. And he mentions the seven Saraswatis. Ah, he says, he mentions the Suparva, the Kanchanakshi, Vishala, Manorama, Ughavati, Surenu, and the Vimalok, uh, Vimala, uh, Vimalokada. Vimala, Vimalo Daka. That's right. So, now these are the seven things that come together at the Tirtha where Balaram had gone and they mingle together at the spot. So the point that is quite clearly coming together is that there are all these rivers coming together. Now, the problem is we do not actually know which of these rivulets was which because we don't know which goes with which except for one, which is the Oghavati. We are clearly told that the Oghavati flowed past Kurukshet. So at, at least we know that one of these rivers passed through Haryana and it was Kurukshetra and this was this is where, why Kurukshetra was near the Ughavati. So, so again, it begins to fit, fit together uh, in many ways. Now, we now know that this, what, what have we learned so far? There was a river, which is now the dry riverbed of the Ghaggar. It flowed exactly where the Rig Veda tells us it flowed, uh, it, it connects clearly to the land called the Sapta Sindhu. The Sapta Sindhu relates only to Haryana, which is basically the area through which the seven um, uh, rivers flowing into the, uh, the Sar Saraswati flowed. So this was where it was. And this we also know was the original homeland of a tribe called the Bharatas. Now the question is, why are the Bharatas important and how is it that their, the name of this tribe, of a small Haryanavi tribe, ended up uh, becoming the name of the entire country? And for that, you have to understand uh, the only political event that we can clearly discern from the Rig Veda. It's clearly very important in the Rig Veda. It's mentioned in various ways, and that is the Battle of the Ten Kings. This is very, very important. And I'm, I'll, I'll uh, tell you what happened so that you, you will immediately see what the importance of this is. Basically, what happened is that the Bharatas were challenged from the West by a confederacy of 10 kings or 10 tribes. <clears throat> uh, and we have the list of all the tribes. And they were attacking them. So the Bharatas decided to take them on and led by their chieftain, whose name was Sudasa, and Sudasa's guru or Rishi Vashishta, they gathered together their troops, they crossed the Saraswati and it's quite clearly described how the Bharata warriors crossed the Saraswati and they moved to deal with these, uh, this confederacy that was coming towards them. And on the banks of the Ravi, uh, the Bharatas completely uh, 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 defeated the coalition of 10 kings. And uh, there is a description of how they are completely uh, defeated and how um, many of the uh, enemy warriors are drowned in the rivers of the Ravi uh, as they try to escape. And so with that big victory, 
uh, the Bharatas became very, very powerful. Now, after that, they moved eastward and on the banks of the Yamuna, we have description that they defeated another chieftain called Bheda. So having done that, the Bharatas created what would perhaps be the first uh, known empire in Indian history, which basically must have covered from Punjab to Western UP. Uh, not a huge area, but clearly much larger than what the Bharatas originally had. But here comes what is interesting. Having defeated all these uh, 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 various tribes and combined them into one empire, the Bharatas did not do what must was a common practice, which is impose their own gods on everybody else. Instead, Vashishta and Sudas decided to get the, the wise uh, uh, men and women of all these different defeated tribes and to collect all their uh, knowledge, not just religious knowledge, but all kinds of knowledge in one place. Uh, and then it's very likely they also invited tribes that are not defeated, but happened to be neighboring tribes. And they compiled all their uh, these ideas into a group of, uh, uh, into a uh, compilation that we now know as the Vedas. So this is what was a unique idea. The unique idea that we need to bring together rather than impose our gods on everybody else, we can assimilate their ideas, their identities, their gods, their, uh, their, their whatever was the knowledge of the time, and we will assimilate it. Now, this was a very powerful idea. And uh, it is um, very clearly, again, mentioned when you, uh, when you read the text. For example, the very last chant of the Rig Veda uh, very clearly mentions this uh, phenomenon. It says, assemble together, speak together, let your minds be all of one accord. It talks about how uh, ancient gods unanimously sit in their appointed chair. In other words, all the gods, not just the gods of the Bharatas, but all the gods have a place around the common fire. Let our minds be common. Uh, common purpose do I lay before you. Worship with general ablation. One and same our resolve. Your minds be of one accord, united in thought. So what are, what are the Bharatas doing? Essentially, what they are doing, they are laying the template of Indic civilization as a concept of assimilation, of bringing together, and in some ways, the operating system of Vedic civilization and, by extension, uh, Hinduism and Indian civilization comes from this idea of assimilation. This is why I, a Bengali from many, many hundreds, many thousands of kilometers to the east of Haryana, why do I consider myself a Bharata? The reason is that a long time ago, my ancestors signed up to this idea of civilization. And that is why I have today called myself a Bharata by the name of a Haryanavi tribe, because I have signed up effectively to this template of civilization. So it is very important because Rig Veda clearly sets out this model. And all of this is happening on the banks of the Saraswati in the land of the Sapta Sindhu, which is in Haryana. Again, this idea that our civilization started somewhere in that sacred area is very, very strongly mentioned in later texts. So, for example, uh, in later texts, the land between the Saraswati and the Dashadvati, again, I mentioned basically Haryana is called Brahmavarta, the region of Brahman or, or Brahma. Um, it is mentioned as Kurukshetra is the land of, you know, it's a sacred land. And even later, the name Haryana itself, by the way, many people sometimes think Haryana is a modern name for the state. It's not. It's a very ancient name. And it also literally means the abode of God, Haryana, Hari as in God. So this idea of Haryana being a sacred land of Brahmavarta is very repeated uh, uh, often in um, our texts. Now, this template of civilization, which I mentioned, over time spreads across the country. So, uh, you know, it may be that in the beginning, the, the idea of Sapta Sindhu is uh, only for, um, you know, uh, the seven rivers. But by the Puranic period, you have here, for example, the <clears throat> in one of the Puranas, in the Brahmakanda, you have uh, a chant, which is quite commonly used uh, even today for ritual bathing, where, and many of you may even use it, um, <clears throat> where it goes, 
ओ गंगा यमुना गोदावरी सरस्वती नर्मदा इंडस कावेरी रिवर्स मे ऑल योर वॉटर्स कम टूगेदर टू क्लेंस मी सो दिस चांट विच इज क्वाइट कॉमनली यूज टूडे यू कैन सी फ्रॉम द आइडिया ऑफ द सप्त सिंधु इन 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 द ऋग्वेदा the idea that you see in the um uh, mahabharata now the idea has spread the land of seven rivers is no longer haryana by the puranic period but covers the entire subcontinent when you mention all the way down to southern india down to kaveri you hear the godavari so you can clearly see how the idea of seven rivers i e of that bharata civilization has spread and it shows through in later texts now what is the river systems that we can see what are the paleo channels tell us about this great river why is it that uh, it was uh, such a flourishing river during the rigvedic period and then it basically seems to have disappeared what was going on well we know a few things from the paleo channels first of all we know that this river used to get a significant amount of water at some some periods of its uh, existence from the uh, uh, glaciers of the himalayas but it also had at at least for some periods uh, the yamuna flowing into the ghaggar you also had the satluj flowing into the ghaggar so there was a lot of river water flowing into this from and you can see there one uh, channel y1 which is the original yamuna then it shifts to y2 and so on and much later there is y3 that is the current which when shifts completely onto the ganga so we can clearly see the shifting of the of the uh, yamuna happening a similar thing happened also with the saraswati uh, sorry with the satluj where the satluj used to also flow so there was a lot of water at at least some parts of the history of this river so this incidentally had an interesting impact on wildlife because what it me has done is that uh, you know indus uh, the indus river uh, dolphins and the ganga dolphins are very very closely related genetically now how could that be because their mouths are very far away the reason it was possible was because these rivers were shifting back and forth and so the dolphin we don't know where it evolved but Uh, let's say it evolved in the ganga basin basically use these shifting rivers to hop across to the indus basin maybe it happened the other way around but it did have this interesting impact that you ended up with both the indus dolphins and the uh, gang- gangetic dolphins essentially being very very closely related even though there is no con- modern connection of these two rivers so now let us move into the mahabharat now the question is we just saw all this was there so at some point in time the yamuna moved and the satluj also moved and as it happens to be the climate also changed so what happens is that what only was at certain points in time this this river getting a lot of uh, glacial water but remember that during the bronze age at least this was much more wet the northwestern india was getting much heavier rain both from the monsoons as well as from the northwest uh, monsoons so the summer monsoons were getting heavier rain and the winter monsoons also so this terrain was much wetter and even if there were no glacial water you have to remember that uh, rain water can be uh, if it's a wet terrain can be more than good enough to sustain a large river after all all the great rivers of southern india are sustained by river water Uh, uh, by rain water and also the great rivers like for example the amazon and the nile etc a lot of the water there is from rain water it's not coming from ice so please get away from this idea that great rivers are always re- always glacially fed it's not the case many of the rivers of india as well as the world are essentially rain fed rivers and they are still very large rivers so don't confuse the need for glacial melt uh, and confuse it with uh, perennial large rivers because it's in a wet climate that is entirely possible now at some point in time clearly this river dried up now is there any evidence of this in our texts as it happens to be our texts do talk about this very very clearly so 
again the mahabharat and it's quite interesting in the mahabharat you still have a memory of the fact that this was a great river so although there's a lot of description of it drying up it still mentions in one place at least in the anusana parva the sacred saraswati is the foremost river of all rivers she courses towards the ocean as and is the truly the first of all streams so this is mentioned there although again it also mentions the drying up it it's essentially this is also where the kurukshetra is situated so again it fits with what we discussed earlier um it mentions the mahabharat this is where the last battle between duryodhan and bhim happened that happens on the south bank of the river at kurukshetra which that's where kurukshetra is uh and it's essentially happen happens there because it's a land that is not too sandy you get the impression that by this point the river has basically broken up into a series of lakes and uh, and you just a minute um and you see that also in balram's uh, uh, pilgrimage so i mentioned balram's pilgrimage remember balram balram was the elder brother of uh, lord krishna and he had refused to take part in the kurukshetra war instead he had gone on this pilgrimage and so he started on this pilgrimage in a place called prabhasa which is near somna down in 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 uh in gujarat which would have been part of the general estuary system of the saraswati and then he proceeded upstream and as he goes through this upstream he keeps mentioning that the river has disappeared into the desert and so you can clearly see there are these uh, lakes that are all that is left and then he makes his all his way to a place called vinashana and vinashana is in- interesting because this is where he mentions that all, you know uh, the rivers come together a little further upstream and then by the time they reach vinashana it, it it basically completely becomes invisible and gets lost in the in the sands of the thar so this is where it basically disappears so you can you can clearly see that by the time of balram doing this the the river had dried up and, uh, in, and was certainly not flowing all the way down to the um uh, to the ocean anymore even though memory was still there but it was still clearly dried up now can we put some dates to all of this now i have used here a paper which the source has given at the bottom but basically after looking through various sources we get a sense that the saraswati was a river with, uh, with which has uh, waxed and waned over time and it is important the geology of this uh, is understood because people very often confuse uh, you know the periods that you're dealing with because the river only makes sense in certain periods and doesn't make sense in other periods uh, when you take the descriptions uh, both of it flowing in the rigveda and of it drying up in the mahabharata So let's go back to uh, 80 000, between 80,000 and and 20,000 years ago it appears to have been a perennial river and this was a period where it was getting a lot of water uh, from the higher himalayas glaciers and it was receiving water from the yamuna and the satluj so this is a long long time ago when it was in full flow is is this is it the period from which the rigveda is describing well if you went by pure description it could be but it's so early that i am i personally am skeptical about the rigveda being that old so i think this is not the period we are dealing with even though you know uh, that that it would have it would have uh, fitted with the physical description now what you have is the ice age much of the world dries up because there is almost like a worldwide drought during the ice age and during this period the river declines um and so between 20000 years ago and 9000 years ago the river basically is a basically a trickle it flows from the shivaliks it's rail fed but it's it's a very small river certainly a shadow of its uh, previous self and then about 9000 years ago that's 7000 bc the river then revives now why does it revive well one part of it certainly is the case that the indian monsoon re- becomes much stronger it's stronger than what it is today and northwestern india was much wetter you were also getting significant rains from the winter monsoon so there's fair amount of rain 
there is some evidence that it was also the saraswati was also began to again receive some himalayan glacier waters perhaps also from the satluj so again this river becomes a significant river much stronger than it was in the ice age so between 7000 bc and 2500 bc this river again revives my own sense is that the rig vedic description relates to this period during this period the river would have been largely rain, rain fed even if it was getting some glacial water and I, that's why i mentioned to you earlier do not have the mental image that only glacial water fed rivers are large and powerful there is you know most of the big rivers in the world are in fact rain fed not glacier fed and uh, even in india the southern rivers are all glacial fed certainly in a you know wet conditions this river could have been quite large and then about 4500 years ago it begins to dry up so and over 500 years it clearly dries up around about 2000 bc which is 4000 years ago it completely dries up and this coincides by with worldwide droughts it coincides incidentally with the collapse of the mature harappan period the sumerian period the giraft civilization in iran and the old dynasty civilization in egypt so there was a cataclysmic uh, climate event and 4000 years ago and many rivers went through many shocks but the saraswati completely dries up now how does this fit with various archaeological sites that we have in order to see this look at the maps on the right they are over time and the earliest one is the bottom the most recent is at the top so let's start at the bottom this is 9000 to 5800 years ago this is the pre harappan period the river at this time is quite strong large um <clears throat> and uh, you can you can uh, you you can see that uh, our best guess is that the yamuna was already no longer flowing into the yamuna uh, into this uh, into the satluj but possibly uh, sorry into the saraswati but possibly the satluj was at this juncture still flowing into the saraswati so it was getting some of the satluj water it was getting a lot of rain fed water and you have these pre harappan sites that are out there and you can see they are popping up already near the uh, saraswati area now then you move into the next uh, 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 picture which is the one just about the bottom one and it says early harappan and the early harappan is between uh, 5800 years ago to 4600 years ago uh, there's a explosion of Uh, uh, new settlements which happen along the saraswati important to note here that this happens uh, um, uh, uh, at a time where this river may already be not at maybe already going through some drying up but it's still a fairly very significant river still flowing and the sites are all along this river my own guess is that the rig veda is composed from the early harappan period and you can see there is a very large number of sites uh, towards the right there's a cluster this probably relates to the harap uh, the bharatas and then you move to the mature harappan period you can see there's a cluster in in the thar cholistan area in the desert there's still very large cluster in haryana and all along the course of the ghaggar so clearly this river is still very important to that civilization at this point in time and then this river then begins to dry up around about um about 4000 years ago so you have the post harappan period 3900 to 3500 bc there is interestingly still a cluster you can see in the desert possibly sustained by the lakes left behind by the drying river but most of the 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 sites have now moved north towards the to closer to the shivaliks as possibly because the drying up meant that these rivers had were only flowing perhaps during the summer monsoon uh, there was probably still some ground water left from the this river system that was being used but the, the there is clearly a drying up of the the ghaggar uh, system so saraswati basically had dried up and there is a dispersal uh, of population the old large harappan uh, the cities are abandoned so very clear and i'm going to just just bef- uh, so that so that at, uh, before i end i give you a sort of a summary of what we have found the texts are very clear that there was a river we know where it was we knew 
It's between the Yamuna and the Sutlej. It flows. There is a river that we can see from satellite photographs. In fact, you can yourself see it on satellite photographs. It's that obvious. Um, even on Google Maps, if you know what you're looking for, you'll be able to find it. Uh, this, there is adequate evidence of a large number of uh, uh, Bronze Age settlements, even pre-Bronze pre Age settlements, explosion of them through the early Bronze Age, then into the mature cities, and then a drying up of this river, which clearly causes a cataclysmic impact on that civilization. It fits with the fact that in the Mahabharata, you mentioned, you have a mention of this drying river, and we now have rough dates for it. So if you're dealing with the Rig Veda, my guess is that uh, two things. One is it mentions a, a strongly flowing river. So you're dealing with something that's either pre-Harappan or very early Harappan in the Rig Veda. That is what you're dealing with. It fits with the fact that the Rig Veda, although it does mention some cities, it doesn't seem to be particularly urban. Uh, it's not a nomadic civilization, as some people may claim. The Rig Veda, however, is not urban either. So it is something which is aware of large cities. There are some uh, large settlements, but not urban in the way mature Harappan is. So this is a pre-mature Harappan uh, civilization. It clearly comes from the area that we now know as Haryana. Uh, there is a clear sense of the landscape of the Sapta Sindhu, which, is, uh, which then we can see that idea of Bharata then spreads across India, but that happens after the collapse of the mature Harappan and the dispersal of population. With that, I hope I have been able to give you a sense of what we know about from the text, this, the geology and the archaeology about this river. Thank you very much, and I'm very, uh, I'll be quite happy to answer any questions people may have. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I, we are extremely grateful for uh, this wonderful insights that you've shared. I'm sure uh, our audience is more enlightened than ever with its own history. Right from the thank you for taking us to these different ages in time, right from uh, where Saraswati started flowing to it becoming uh, very quintessential for uh, the Bharatas and how our country came to be called as Bharat. And uh, I am sure that our youth are going to leave uh, more informed than ever. And uh, as I, even I am quite fascinated that I didn't know that it was the land of the Sapta Sindhu, basically. So thank you so much. It is uh, a, a heartwarming accord of an account of uh, this journey of uh, the, the, uh, the river and the civilization uh, that uh, has now come to be called as Bharat and the river was Saraswati indeed and there are questions that we have from our audience so I will quickly post these questions to you we have uh, one of the youngsters who's actually asked that how is it important uh, that these geographies and cultures how really important they are to our behavior so obviously there is a very close link between our geography and our civilization it is not static because that idea changes. I mentioned to you how an idea of civilization, which was born in, 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 a, in a particular tribe, the Bharatas of Haryana, then spread across the country. Now, it is important here to notice that it is not the case that when this, I, this particular idea of civilization spread from, from the original homeland in Haryana, that the rest of the country was not, did not have people living there or there weren't civilizations there. Now, this is very important. We now have lots of evidence that when there was a Bronze Age civilization in the Harappan period in the northwest of the country, there were already settled civilizations or peoples and cultures in the rest of the country already, including, for example, in the Gangetic Plains. Now, they were not entirely isolated. Obviously, they have a co-evolved civilization. They were aware of each other. They were trading with each other, probably fought wars with each other. Uh, for example, uh, in, in Bagpat, we have, we have found uh, chariots of a civilization which uh, almost certainly had links with the Harappans, but is distinct enough, Gangetic to a, another culture. So, you know, so there were civilizations already existing in the Gangetic plate. So it's not the case that the people of the Harappan or the Vedic people got civilization as such to uh, the Gangetic plains or to other, and we have... Similar, you know, we have found that in Urissa, in, now I'm, there are some archaeological sites even in the peninsula of India, which suggests a fairly old uh, established civilizations. In fact, Iron Age India starts in the Godavari Valley, where the earliest uh, signs of 
um, uh, systematic use of iron anywhere in the world is there so what is interesting about the idea of the bharatas was not that they took a bharata civilization and gave it to everybody else mm -hmm. because that goes exactly against what they were doing what they were doing is essentially providing a template think of it as an operating system this is very different from a idea that this is the system everybody has to use this app. instead what they said the the vedic system is actually an operating system on which everybody else could load their apps you see so what they are doing is what what does the last suktam of the rigveda say that all the ancient gods have a place around the sacrificial fire let's come together and chant together and speak mm -hmm. together in one voice so this is an idea of assimilation and so indian civilization essentially grows by assimilation of these new ideas right so very often in the texts you will hear um, um you know the, the idea of you know new gods that are sometimes so academic uh, literature for example very often will say you know there were these ancient vedic gods like varuna indra etc and then later gods of like vishnu shiva etc yes. now that's not true of the indic tradition in the indic tradition we never think of shiva as a new god right yes sir so is durga a new god goddess no what is happening here is that these gods and goddesses are just as ancient as the vedic gods they just happened to be worshiped in areas that were not yet in contact with the bharata tribe of haryana mm -hmm. now when the idea, this template spread it incorporated these other ideas of gods and in fact even the rigveda does not claim to be the origin of any of the stuptam rigveda itself claims to be a compilation of what had already existed that's why the idea is of shashvat or you know sanatan eternal so they are basically the, this is just a compilation of what existed already and a template for further accretion along the way so creating space along the, the around the sacrificial fire and it's a very significant and powerful idea because not allowing a god a place around the sacrificial fire is in some way it's a violation of the pact of the rigveda that the bharatas had put together and you see that for example happening with in the case of shiva now shiva is clearly a some you you get a sense that he is in in later texts that he's a bit of a problematic god you know he is not a goody goody god right he's clearly powerful but he does sort of idiosyncratic things um so he, there must have been some occasions when uh, some of the orthodox would have said we don't allow him a place along the sacrificial fire and so you have this story of him not being invited by his father in law daksha to the sacrifice and sati turns up and she sacrifices herself to that into that fire yes. and shiva arrives picks up picks up her body and then of course vishnu shatters it into pieces and throws it all across the country so what is going on here essentially what is happening is daksha is violating the rigvedic pact by not inviting a god an ancient god who by rights has a place around the fire and then sati consequently violates and destroys that yagya and then in her own body by by its own shattering and falling across the landscape of india she unites it, it all again so if you look at a map of where all the shakti peethas are it's quite interesting the eastern most shakti peetha is in tripura tripura sundari the western most is hinglaj mata in balochistan the northern most are sharda peet in kashmir southern most is kanyakumari or some would say there's also one shakti peet in northern jaffna but you can see it's a very clear geographical uh, location in some ways the parameters of our land of our indic landscape and again shankaracharya goes on all these trips across the country and he creates much he creates the four ends of the country so you can see that the idea of sapta sindhu the idea of indian civilization is very closely linked to the spreading of the idea of what is the sacred land it starts with brahmavarta which is limited geography and spreads the the seven rivers 
become from just the tributaries of the Saraswati to becoming the tributaries, uh, or rather the rivers across the country. The, the Shakti Pithas actually physically, you know, unites the country in one body, uh, in the body of Sati. So this is an important part of how this idea is repeated. Even when you do, for example, um, you know, uh, 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 many, many yagyas, you very often, you will unite the uh, country by chanting this, uh, some version of the Nadistuta Suktam in terms of how all the waters of various uh, rivers come together. That is so basically all in all uh, this about this is how uh, this entire uh, passage of time formed what today has become our culture and that, that's how it's affected our behavior, right? So we've been talking about history all in all together from uh, the times of the Rig Vedas and we, we for Saraswati River, we went back to 80,000 uh, BC, I guess. So um, my question uh, from one of the audience members as it has come about is, is on history again. And one of the youngsters asks us that history is actually written by people who have won the war. So how can the youth today get access to this obliterated history and how do we assess what its, what its authenticity is? Well, as I said, remember that there is, you know, you have to allow for some amount of variation in interpretations. Nevertheless, uh, as I always say, you know, uh, historians have a right to their interpretations. They don't have a right to their facts. So yes. what we have to do is to go back and look at what the primary evidence says. Uh, you know, for example, I have somewhat idiosyncratic views perhaps on many things. The point is, is it based on a reasonable interpretation of the facts that exist? I, for example, have a difficulty in believing that Ashoka was the great. And I have made my arguments in, in, in a certain way. So another um, historian may think that he's genuinely Ashoka the great. Now, it's not like either of us had breakfast with Ashoka. Right? Both of us are interpreting a limited amount of evidence. The point is to present that evidence as honestly as possible and say that, look, this is the evidence and this is what I have to say. This is the same thing I've done with the Saraswati. I have presented to you the, what the evidence is. There's very clear that the Saraswati flows through India. So all this idea of it flowing somewhere in Central Asia is clearly not true uh, because the, the primary source of knowledge of the Saraswati, the earliest knowledge, uh, uh, clearly tells you where the Saraswati is. It also tells you that it, it goes from the mountains to the sea. There is an evidence of a uh, geological evidence of, the, of such a river flowing. There is also archaeological evidence of large numbers of settlements along it. You know, you really have to do all kinds of gymnastics and contortions in order to escape the fact that the Saraswati and the Ghaggar are the same. Yes, sir. I, I am extremely grateful to you for, uh, I think with this, uh, we've actually come to the close of uh, today's session also because uh, of the paucity of time. It's been quite insightful. Thank you so much for taking us uh, through a history and time and uh, for uh, enlightening the youth and enabling them to connect with their roots. Um, and uh, I'm sure, like I mentioned the start, you know, I, by quoting uh, Swami Vivekananda, if you want to progress forward, we actually have to be familiar with what our roots are and you've done it and you've done it so well. So thank you so much. And it's an honor uh, to have you here. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was Sri Sanjeev Sanyalji presenting his thoughts on uh, Saraswati uh, and how it gave birth to River Saraswati, how it gave birth to the Indian civilization. Thank you so much. On this count, uh, we'll Namaste. take your leave and uh, stay tuned for the next session that is about to come on. It's an open town hall on Olympians and the Paralympians. So uh, the theme of that session stands sports, a unifier for Ek Bharat and Shreshta Bharat. That's between four to five. Stay tuned. And thank you, sir. Thank you for having us here, uh, being with us. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Thank you. Jai Hind.